We begin this series during World War II. The United States and the rest of the Allies were fighting the Axis powers, including Germany and Japan, in what had become the largest military conflict in human history. Obviously, everybody was looking for whatever advantage they could find. So when German scientists began developing a bomb that could destroy entire cities using nuclear fission, or the process of splitting atoms, everybody else scrambled to catch up. The United States launched the Manhattan Project, which enlisted physicists, including many who had fled Nazi Germany, to try to invent the greatest weapon known to man. Long story short, they ended up being the first ones to successfully produce a nuclear bomb, and then shortly thereafter, in the summer of 1945, dropped two of said bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan as a strong-handed and controversial move to end the war. The bombs killed over 200,000 people between the two cities and left countless others to suffer from long-term effects of radiation. The bomb ended the war but began the nuclear age and led the world into a time of great fear and uncertainty over what it meant to live in a world where all of mankind could be totally obliterated with the push of a button and where nuclear and radioactive particles possessed a power and mystery that most people could not even begin to comprehend. Upon witnessing the first nuclear bomb test, Robert Oppenheimer, the director of the Manhattan Project, uttered the words, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, from the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, and perhaps no words would become more important to the tone of the B-movies that followed World War II. and discuss the horrific, the obscure, and the flat-out strange from the other side of cinema. I'm Mark Dickerson. And I'm Jeremy Fink. And this is the first in our new series, After the Bomb, sci-fi movies of the 1950s. The first film we'll be talking about today is Godzilla. Hiro Honda, full disclaimer, we apologize in advance for the terrible pronunciations which may follow in this episode, <laughs> yes. that follows the story of a fire-breathing sea creature that terrorizes Japan after being awakened by an atomic bomb test. Godzilla would go on to become a cultural phenomenon and is still, to this day, the longest-running film series of all time. Mm. Yeah, when you think about it, there are a lot of these films and a lot of these types of films uh, that came out after this one mm -hmm. but this was essentially the first not the first monster movie because obviously you had king kong and you know things like that uh lost world and all of that but um this was uh, a different sort of thing and i think it's a great one to kick off this series jeremy i think it's it's kind mm -hmm. of the perfect one to kick it off mm -hmm. um and there's somewhat of a debate when we chose the films because godzilla is obviously such a huge film and and like we said, kicked off this entire franchise that is still going to this day. I mean, there's a new Godzilla movie that just came out very mm. recently. And there will probably um, be another one. And there will probably be another one soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another one this year or next year. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so it's it's almost like you would want to call it mainstream. But mm -hmm. I would argue that because it, it it's I, I still see this film and these types of film as very niche mm -hmm. and um, very specific to a certain type of movie fan. Um, so I think it works, and I think there's a there is a, a certain cult around these types of films, a certain fandom, mm -hmm. and uh, so it could be argued that these are also seen as cult films. Mm 
Um, so yeah, we're, I think, and also on top of that, starting with a Japanese film, uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, wartime uh, atrocities and, and things like that. We're just going to be just slightly touching on these subjects because obviously these are very serious, uh, deep subjects that we could get into and have multiple episodes on just on the historical context, but we just want to touch on it because obviously it's a huge part of the series. And I think starting with Japan um, in particular makes a lot of sense. And I think because this was the movie that kind of kicked everything off with this type of uh, sci-fi genre piece um, about atomic energy, about radiation and things like that, these types of concerns, um, I think it just makes a lot of sense to start with Godzilla. And um, Jeremy, had you seen this movie before or was this first viewing for you? So this is one of those movies because of its uh, cultural impact that I probably through the years have seen the entire thing in bits mm. and pieces. But You've I have, absorbed it in some way. <laughs> I've absorbed it because there are obviously, you know, a lot of very familiar images. Um, but was it the American version or the... So we're particularly discussing uh, the Japanese version, the original true. version that came out in 1954. Mm -hmm. Then there was an American version that came out a couple years later uh, called Godzilla King of the Monsters. And we are going to touch on that towards the end, but... Mostly, uh, we're going to mainly be talking about the original film. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I, I'm honestly not sure. I've probably seen a combination of mm -hmm. the Japanese version and the, the American yeah. dub version. Um, yeah. But it, it was really, a really an exciting thing for me to just sit down and, and watch this movie. It's kind of one of those behemoths. And, you know, as most of our listeners on this podcast, I would imagine, are, are pretty hardcore cinephiles or budding mm -hmm. cinephiles. But everyone yeah. has movies on their list that you feel like you should have seen. You know, they're, they're just yeah. those big movies that everyone, you know, oh, I can't believe you haven't seen this. I can't believe you haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. And for me, Godzilla was definitely one of those movies. So yeah. I, was, I was super, super excited. And mm -hmm. e even from the opening seconds of the movie, when you, oh, my God. like yeah. just the sound design that comes in, you, you're I love kind that of opening. just totally wrapped up in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the opening titles I, I just love so much. Um, they're so simple, <laughs> yet mm -hmm. so... But it's so ominous and so foreboding. Um, just this scrolling text and you just hear the sounds and the roars of, of something. You don't even know what it is yet mm -hmm. uh, because you haven't seen it yet. I mean, obviously, you know, because you know what Godzilla is. But yeah. at, the, at the time, just imagine sitting in the theater and, and hearing these sounds and, you know, and then the music comes in and the music is so iconic um, mm -hmm. for this film. And I want to talk about that later, too. But the combination of these these otherworldly sounds of some prehistoric creature and then there's this music that comes in along with the very simple scrolling text i mean it's i think it's a perfect way to start a monster movie in yeah my, in my opinion <laughs> yeah it, it, it kind of gets right into it um mm -hmm. and, and then even in the beginning like i, I think w one thing that kind of struck me about this monster movie because I, I always find it fascinating with these type of monster movies and disaster movies in general it raises a really interesting question because you obviously, in, in good story structure, you generally want a main character or a handful of main characters that you can kind of follow and see mm -hmm. the story through. Um, mm -hmm. And what struck me in a really interesting... But, but in, a, in a monster movie or a disaster movie, when the conflict is happening to everybody, you know, it, it's not just happening to a select... You know, it's not like a horror film where there's, you know, a murderer in the house and there's one main character who it's happening to and maybe it's only a small group of characters who are experiencing yeah. it and you, you can contemplate all of them. Whereas with something like this, you know, this monster is terrorizing so many people that we mm -hmm. just don't have time to follow every single mm -hmm. one. Um, so mm -hmm. what ends up happening a lot of the time is, you know, you develop your main characters and you're kind of with them the whole time. Um, but what I thought was really interesting about this film is the first 20 minutes or so, you're kind of getting little glimpses of a lot of mm -hmm. different lives and yeah. how they're being affected. And you're not even really sure who you're going to end up following yet, which yeah. I thought was a really, really exciting cool. and creative yeah. way to set it up because it kind of did make you feel this thing where like it's like you you understand the magnitude of it. Mm -hmm. it it's not just it's not just a monster that's after our main characters it's a right. monster that's after everybody and is ruthless and and, and non-discerning and random which i thought was really yeah. exciting it's really interesting because with what you know with time and with what godzilla has become uh, as a pop culture icon and the kind of destructive movie monster you know that uh, the kind of genre that I guess you could say was unleashed after this. Um, it's interesting because this this film, the original film, 
is very serious. Uh, the tone mm -hmm. is very like, you know, obviously like I would say somber because mm -hmm. of, of the context and everything. Um, it's really not played for laughs at all. No. Um, like you could even say like parts of the original King Kong were and things like that. Like that, that had moments of levity as well. Mm -hmm. um, but this film's a lot more somber, a lot more serious, um, a lot more fo foreboding, mm -hmm. uh, which makes sense again, when you consider uh, historical context with this mm -hmm. and um so, yeah, I mean, it's interesting in that regard because on one hand, it's like, yeah, this is a, a monster movie. You know, we talk about a lot of B monster movies. We talk about a lot of, you know, exploitation movies mm -hmm. on this podcast. But we also talk about more art house, more underground type films. And I, I would say this one's sort of in the middle, yeah. um, mixed with a bit of a mainstream feel as well. Yeah. So it's kind of like everything all in one. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, like you said, it's kind of the concept. It kind of sounds like a B movie. You know, if someone yeah. were to just tell you about this, if you, you just know, took it at face value, yeah, out of context, sure. oh, you know, it's it's this monster that comes out of the sea because of, of a bomb that went off that was being destroys tested, a city, destroys the city, fire, yeah. yeah, you're like, oh, that's absurd. But but when you watch it and you, and you think about the people who were creating this film, you know, we're talking about this movie came out in 1954, mm -hmm. and you know, I don't, you know, obviously some of our listeners are filmmakers, some are not, but movies take a really long time from conception to actually being finished so it's I, I don't know when the script for this film was written but my guess would be you know at the at the latest probably 1951 or 52 so we're, we're talking about just slightly over half a decade since the nuclear bomb went off in the home country of yeah, the people creating this movie after yeah yeah so, so so there really wouldn't be a lot of humor involved in yeah. writing something mm -hmm. about the nuclear nuclear bomb, and it, it, there really isn't. This this film is totally, mm -hmm. um, it's it's very serious, very focused, but it, it never yeah. felt stiff to me. It, it no. never felt like like it took itself seriously, but it, it never felt like um, mm -hmm. it, it felt like it should take itself seriously. It, yeah, well, the, yeah, the bomb was very much in recent history for them. Uh, recent memory for them and um yeah it's it's uh like we said it's a little it's a bit somber in tone a bit serious but like you said jeremy it's it i think it's because it keeps moving i think the plot is mm -hmm. continually changing and you have the sense of that foreboding because you know godzilla is coming you know something is coming mm -hmm. uh you know that something is emerging from the sea and coming towards the mainland of tokyo um so yeah, it's it's you have this feeling throughout this this kind of ominous feeling, and it it's uh it's really something. It's really palpable, mm -hmm. and especially like I keep thinking of I keep going back to in my mind the time that this film came out, what people must have been thinking because not knowing what Godzilla was yet or not seeing mm -hmm. it yet, and the way that he's introduced in the film, and I do want to talk about that a little bit because I think it's interesting from a filmmaking standpoint, um, because the the full monster itself, Godzilla itself, uh, the full appearance. The, actually, the full appearance was to be re revealed during uh, much earlier in the film, during the Odo Island hurricane scene. But uh, the director he opted to show it, to show only parts of it, and then mm -hmm. later he would have the full reveal to kind of build up to that. Uh, but I think that works really well because you have, you know, like the giant footprints on the beach. I think is very effective, mm -hmm. uh, very eerie to see that and without actually seeing the full body and you, you do see his head sticking out over yeah. like a mountain mountainside. And then, um, cause it, it gives us the idea of the size mm -hmm. of what we're dealing with. Um, and then later on a little bit later after that, there's Godzilla's head sticking out of the water. Yeah. And you, so you just seeing you get parts piece of by him. piece. Yeah. And then eventually, you know, he makes his way to the mainland of Japan and that's when we get the full reveal. And I think it's so effective for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can see that echoed throughout uh, lots of different movies. Mm -hmm. uh, the first ones that came to mind for me were Jaws, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, because you're not seeing the, the shark that often in the movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when you do see it, it's very effective. Um, also, in the first Jurassic Park Jurassic movie, Park, yeah, yeah that sure. you can see a lot of these techniques uh, implemented there, mm -hmm. whether or not they were intentional or not. Mm -hmm. um, they're just very effective effective techniques but, but what did you think jeremy yeah so I, I i loved how the monster was kind of slowly revealed um my one of my if not my favorite moment in the whole movie is actually the footprints and what preceded yeah, I love it that. um i think it's you know obviously over time our expectation of monsters changes so that that first time you see godzilla's head you know i i think we kind of have all seen that shot so many times 
Um, just it's, it's such a cultural phenomenon. We've seen that shot that that one didn't really scare me necessarily in the way it could have. I think had I had no idea what this movie was going in, kind of just like oh, there's there's, there's Godzilla. Godzilla. But yeah, but but I think you know, having if I didn't have any idea who this was, mm-hmm. like even today, I think it's a scary looking monster. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I love the footprint moment and and that in sequence with seeing the head. And the reason I love that so much was because um, I, I think so much of what makes a monster scary is kind of the a monster like this where it's kind of more animal than human there, there's no logic function no logical decision making that goes into it it mm-hmm. is that randomness that, that it's its decisions are so unpredictable because it might decide to eat someone or step on someone or breathe fire mm-hmm. but it might not and, and I love that moment because we see Godzilla's head poke up over this mountain and it seems like it's about to come towards all of these people who are screaming and freaking mm-hmm. out and we're preparing for that and then it just turns and goes away Mm-hmm. And, and for me, that was was such a great moment. And then we see the footprints and we understand the scope of it. And, and for me, that was such an exciting moment because it made this monster feel like it did whatever it wanted to. It didn't yeah. feel like it was something <laughs> that it was being written by a human being. It felt mm-hmm. like it, it just, maybe it would go this direction. Maybe it would yeah. go another direction. And I, I think that set up where you, you can't trust it. Like you, you know that a, a monster that makes decisions mm-hmm. that randomly isn't going to have a moment at the end of the movie where it becomes sweet all of a sudden where it mm-hmm. becomes timid. Like, that monster is going to do whatever it wants whenever mm-hmm. it wants that whole movie, and it either has to be defeated or it's going to defeat you. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm just going to go this way for a little bit. I'll be back, guys. And yeah. I'm just going <laughs> to no hang reason. out in the water over here. Yeah. yeah, no rhyme or reason, which is, is so exciting. <laughs> because when something is that large, I mean, it can pretty much do what it wants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, so. It's indestructible. It um, survived nuclear blasts. It can do yeah, anything. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, to go into the plot a little bit, um, so there is... Uh, because so so basically there is a blast or because so is there actually a blast in the beginning i'm trying to remember or do they just allude to a blast so um, they, they i think they just allude to it although okay, so they, i i would maybe say that the thinking of it now those opening sounds of godzilla in the beginning of the movie may have been like an awakening yeah so because of of whether it's you know test bomb testing or mm-hmm. just just a bomb has gone off somewhere mm-hmm. near this area um, a creature is awakened in the ocean off the shores of japan and uh, the residents of japan slowly become aware of this and uh, i believe it's fishermen on a boat which is a, an allusion to an, another another historical event that actually happened mm-hmm. uh, regarding radiation um, and they witness something in the water and come back to tell everyone and that's when the pandemic starts and uh, we ha- we have this feeling of impending doom that we've referred to um, of this creature because they know it's getting closer. And what are they going to do? Because when it gets there, it's going to destroy everything. Um, and in the midst of it all, we have this uh, a bit of a love triangle, actually. Uh, it's a love story going on for some added drama um, with three of the main characters, uh, a scientist character who wears a really cool eye patch. <laughs> Uh, I believe it's Daisuke. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that exactly correctly. And then there's um, the woman he's in love with, uh, Amiko. And then um, Hideto? Hideo. Hideo, I'm sorry. Yeah, Hideto. Yeah, I'm not I sure. Think. Hideto, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are going to butcher these names, by the way. No. Um, <laughs> Apologies. We are, tr- we are trying. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hideto, we're going to go with. Yeah, so he's the other, um, the other character. And so the three of them have this sort of love triangle going on um, while they're also studying the creature and going back and forth about how to best uh, take care of the creature. And there's uh, a lot going into that. But that's the, the basic idea. But as Jeremy, as you alluded to, there are lots of characters, um, mm-hmm. not so many that we focus on, but there's you get that feeling that there are just lots of military people involved mm-hmm. and other scientists and they're all working together to try to solve this problem but yeah. obviously there's not a really a clear solution yeah it's, um, as in real life you it, know there'd be lots yeah. of different ways to go about it so yeah it's and a that's, whole where, that's where the drama yeah and that's mm-hmm. where the drama comes from it's like okay we know this thing is coming what do we do yeah. um it's it's you know they do go into okay what caused it mm-hmm. but then now how do we take care of that so that those are the questions at play um, and it goes much deeper than just this is a monster we have to kill it yeah you know it, it goes into uh, atomic radiation it goes into mass destruction the weapons of you know the means of mass destruction and and what was on everyone's mind very recently historically at this time mm-hmm. um, with the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima um, and there is uh, just a lot of different ways to look at this film historically that I think are very interesting I think 
you know, taking all of that into context, I think it just makes this movie just elevates it so, so much. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you could say that a lot of it's kind of on the nose. You could say that the messages mm-hmm. is, is a little, you know, some of the messaging is a little blatant, but mm-hmm. I feel like it had to be because, yeah. you know, and at that time, and especially in Japan, for a film mm-hmm. to be taking these things head on and just, you know, right on the nose being just coming right out there and saying certain things, a lot of things that were actually censored in the American version of this movie. Um, it's pretty bold and yep. it's, it's, uh, I think it needed to be done mm-hmm. in a certain way. I think this movie was very cathartic for a lot of people yep. at that time, um, for people in Japan. So, um, but what, what were your thoughts on that, Jeremy? Yeah. I, I mean, I think some of the stuff maybe seems on the nose now, but we were, we were talking about a problem that people didn't really understand yet. You know, it was like, I mean, I mean, my guess would be that when the atomic bomb was dropped, most Japanese people didn't even know something like that existed. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not like this was a there thing There had where, been bombings before, but that was like, yeah. obviously... Well, and, 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 and uh, th- there have yeah. been plenty of stories. Sorry, there have been plenty of stories about how um, on that day, a lot of people didn't even bother taking cover because there were so many planes... That were yeah, flying like over so on a daily basis. Point. They were so mm-hmm. used to it that none of them were like, oh, it's just, you know, they're just normal mm-hmm. U.S. fighter planes, you know, it's mm-hmm. nothing, which ended up costing a lot of people their lives. So so the, this idea of this this atomic bomb was so new and, and so kind of crazy. And then the reaction to that, I mean, I, I think back because the as, you know, someone who grew up in the United States, the closest thing in, in my lifetime that I could compare it to, not that it, you know, I, you would ever want to compare tragedies, but it's kind of like how pre nine eleven and post nine eleven were very different worlds. You know, mm-hmm. and it took years and years and years. Not that we still can totally make sense of nine eleven, but it took years for people to even kind of start to reckon with it and figure mm-hmm. it out. And you know, and you think about in in Japan, it's like we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people just dying in an instant. And it's like, that's not the kind of thing you figure out in a week. That takes years and years and years. And the questions that they're bringing up in this film, even if they seem kind of on the nose now, were still probably very new and very mm-hmm. complicated for them at that time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's still a lot to deal with, like mentally, just thinking mm-hmm. about these things. So the fact that you have a huge uh, symbolic creature, you know, it's it's convenient in some ways, but also in some ways it's just like you almost need that. Mm-hmm. Like it's so simplistic that it's, it's yeah. like... You know, if you're gra- trying to grasp with these very complicated feelings and emotions mm-hmm. about something so horrifying, um, you know, you, you almost need something. And I think in that way, the film is very cathartic. And mm-hmm. um, I want to talk about the monster. I want to talk about Godzilla as a, um, a sympathetic creature, mm-hmm. um, because I, I think in a lot of ways it is. Yep. And a lot of people, even at the time, saw it that way. Um because there's lots of different messages going on. So, for instance, um, the girl's father, um, who's also a scientist, I believe, and he was in a lot of Akira Kurosawa movies, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the older scientist, and he has a line where, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, but he says something like, all they want to do is kill it, not study it. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's talking about, like, how they just want to, you know, use destruction to get rid of the creature, and where as you know you could actually study the creature and learn something from it and i think that's like a huge part of the message here Mm -hmm. um and you know so going back to what i said about uh godzilla itself being sort of like sympathetic um you know because i felt my myself a lot of times feeling bad for the creature Mm -hmm. um and much like king kong i mean you the filmmakers clearly want you to to have that sort of uh empathy for the creature Mm -hmm. um and i i definitely felt that um and um, I don't know if you got that feeling as well, um, because even though he's causing all this st- destruction once he does get to the mainland, um, it's almost like he's a misunderstood creature. You know, it's like and it's also like has society just brought this on themselves? Yeah. Like, you know, this this creature was an ancient entity mm-hmm. um, and he was there long before any of these other people were here. Yeah. And, you know, now he's reemerged. Um, and even though his first reaction is to. Uh, destroy the city and kill people um it's the fact that he's destroying modern cities you know it's, mm-hmm. it's something about that this ancient creature yeah. the symbolism there of this ancient monster destroying modern what, the, what at the time was modern tokyo mm-hmm. um there is something very strong about that that imagery yeah um and it's almost like yes like this is our penance like this like we've gone too far with technology and you know this is like almost what what human beings deserve um, in a certain way, in a certain like masochistic way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, again, like society's kind of brought this on themselves, but, um, and um, you know, I think this movie does owe a lot to King Kong. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. we talked about 
um, how it's a very Japanese production, um, obviously. But um, do you do you see there being American inspirations as well uh, at play here, Jeremy? I mean, obviously, King Kong. There was also the 1953 American film, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, mm-hmm. which was a big inspiration on this movie. So do you see there being uh, American influences as uh, at play as well here? Yeah, totally. And interestingly, the movie that came to mind whenever I thought of Godzilla as a sympathetic character was actually Frankenstein. Um, yeah, definitely. Which, yeah, even though it's not reanimated, yeah, yeah. It's, a, you know, obviously it's not like the, the huge destroyer kind of character, but yeah. this idea of, you know, this, this kind of creature who was brought onto this earth but didn't really ask for it Mm -hmm. you know and and is forced to reckon with it and goes on a rampage and yeah yeah. but it's like kind of like most of it seems to be from confusion i mean i I, I think Mm -hmm. about you know the feeling like like i live in new york city and you know it's like whenever i see a cockroach i freak out like i totally Mm -hmm. panic because they're horrifying (laughs) and i want to kill it immediately because it scares me and i'm way bigger than it it can't (laughs) <laughs> like it i mean i guess they carry diseases but like you can't really do right. anything to me but like yeah. you know so you think about it, even though he's this big this bigger creature it's like all mm-hmm. of a sudden you know he's been living underwater doing his thing for mm-hmm. who knows how long you know ancient and all of a sudden he has all these things <laughs> running around near him you trying know to kill him. trying to kill him it's like mm-hmm. I, you know i kind of get why he'd be a little yeah. ticked off yeah. and have a reaction it's all right it's all perspective really yeah. um so that's one way to look at the film and i think that's a very interesting way to look at it Mm -hmm. um but as we talked about jeremy before we recorded there's kind of like lots of different messages going on here because in the end i mean i don't think this is too much of a spoiler they they use um a weapon to destroy the creature Mm -hmm. uh it's it's a a new weapon i believe it's invented for this movie Mm -hmm. um because uh the commentary i watched was was talking about how it makes absolutely no sense (laughs) at all (laughs) it's actually pretty ridiculous it's a it's an oxygen destroyer, right? Mm-hmm. That's what it's called. Um, so in the movie, it's they show it being tested and it kills, uh, disintegrates fish, I believe. Yeah. So you just see like the skeletal remains of a fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, it would just take away all the water if it's getting rid of the oxygen. So yes. it's sort of like a ridiculous thing. But again, it's a this is sci- look, it is in the at the end of the day, it is a B movie. It is sci-fi in certain ways. Wouldn't, wouldn't um, that have been so. an interesting ending though if they used that thing and instead of yeah. killing Godzilla, <laughs> it just got rid of all the water and then oh like twenty God. other Godzillas just popped up? Wow, that would have been amazing. That, that would have been would have been as. Actually, no, they could have made more sequels. They could have made a lot of that. sequels, but also, you know, like meaning-wise, it's like you use one thinking you're going to solve the problem. I don't know. Yeah. Not, not that I'm changing the ending. I, who yeah. am I to change the ending of Godzilla? But you know, well, no, you're right. I mean, I think because I think it is almost too tidy of an ending in a way but yeah. not that you can really fault them for it like you know mm-hmm. they're trying to just tell a self-contained story and yeah you, know, you, you gotta kill it, it. Is, but yeah yeah you gotta kill the thing so um but we were me and jeremy were talking about how uh you know it it does send different messages about mm-hmm. about atomic weaponry and about radiation because you know you, in certain ways you can see the creature as like just a metaphor for mm-hmm. atomic energy because you know it, it literally gives off radiation i mean so um, the fact that they kill it with another <laughs> yeah. very large scale mm-hmm. weapon is, is interesting. Um, and I'm not sure if that was meant to, you know, to be a, a deep meaning that we're supposed to look into or if it's just like, all right, we have to kill this thing somehow. So mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we just invented something that's going to do that for us. But I mean, they're obviously still conflicted about it. And mm-hmm. the um, the one scientist uh, with the eye patch, uh, again, very cool. Sarazawa. Uh, <laughs> Sarazawa um, is obviously extremely conflicted about it, mm-hmm. and ha- there's many scenes of him like, you know, should we do this? You know, if we do use this bomb that mm-hmm. I created, it's it's going to be a one time thing. So y- you obviously see that they yeah. are conflicted about it. It's not just a simple mm-hmm. uh, thing like that. So that's that's good that they did uh, approach it that way at least. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's a complicated thing. The whole, you know, the whole movie is very, there's lots mm-hmm. of different like perspectives going on. Cause then you have the military perspective, which is like, mm-hmm. let's kill it, you know? And that's, you see that in a lot of movies too, but mm-hmm. um, you know, these, these scientists are obviously conflicted and then you have the, just the regular civilians, you know, and they do touch on that just a little bit, not too much, but I think when they do, it's very poignant. Mm-hmm. And this was a, an example of another scene that was taken out of the American version because it was, Oddly enough, you know, in the American version, too, uh, too reminiscent of wartime activity. But when you have the the mother cowering with her mm-hmm. two very small children, it's a beautiful shot, um, beautiful scene. Yeah, where, where um, it's very short, but she mm-hmm. says something like, "We're gonna we're gonna be with daddy soon." Like you know, mm-hmm. she's kind of just she's just shielding her children as Godzilla is rampaging and just preparing for the worst and just saying like, "We're gonna be with your father soon." And mm-hmm. and a lot of people took that to mean 
you know, you're, the father had died in the war because of, of war related activity and mm-hmm. we're, we're going to go visit him, which if you look at the age of the children, that couldn't have actually been true because they're yeah. so young. But I think it still mm-hmm. does. There's something evocative that this yeah. scene brings up and it's very strong. And, and even with without having that in mind, when you watch that scene, it's very uh I, I i was actually hit in the gut by it when i oh, watched totally. it because I, I i had forgotten about it and i kind of just went like oh my god i think i mm-hmm. even said it out loud to myself because i just yeah i mean that's it's um that's everything right there like that's the price that we pay and that's yep. that's the toll and those are the people that get affected um so yeah that scene uh for me was one of the strongest i thought yeah and that's that's one of those rich moments that comes back to this idea of not just making it about a set of main characters and they're the only ones you care about um, because so many times in disaster movies and, or, or you know, you'll see like, like you know, a superhero movie and you'll see a building get knocked over or something like that. And like, you know, that there are people in those buildings and that terrible tragedy is befalling all of them, but because they're not one of your handful of main characters, it becomes easy to just write it off and not yeah. really kind of feel the, mm-hmm. the, the pain of the, the mass, you know, terrible deaths that are happening. And right. just little moments like that for me in this movie made it hurt so much more when you saw all this destruction because you had char- you, you had sympathy and empathy for characters that weren't important. You know, you'd be, you'd be, not that she wasn't important, but like that weren't central to the storyline. Like that woman, we don't know her name. We don't know those kids' names. But we understand that if, if one character whose name we don't know is suffering and panicking mm. and, and feeling genuine horror, not just like, uh, I'm scared, run away horror, but like genuine, yeah. like, oh, you know. Not just yeah. screaming and running away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's genuine, is, like, pain. We're going to go see your father soon. Yeah. Like, it, it's, Which, it's interesting because, like, mm-hmm. the image of, you know, like, it's it's almost like cliche. Well, it is a cliche at this point mm-hmm. of, like, the screaming Japanese running away mm-hmm. uh, from a monster. Like, you see that parody in so many movies now. Yeah. Um, or, you know, at least you did at some point where anytime there's a monster attacking a city, it's like you see these fleeing Japanese and, yeah. oh, my God, the monster's coming for us. But, like, really, in the original film, the, mm-hmm. the original Godzilla, um, you have moments like that where it's yeah. just very, point, very poignant. and A lot uh, of detail. A lot different than yeah. you would imagine, yeah. So, mm-hmm. um yeah, and I think it's those kind of things that make this that elevates this film so much. Um, it makes it so worth watching, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we we've touched on a lot of like the serious tones of the film and the messages. Um, and I'm sure we're not done with completely done with that. But mm-hmm. I want to touch on obviously a huge part of this film, uh, the special effects, uh, mm-hmm. the creature design and special effects, which was very big deal at the time, and I still think to this day holds up uh, very well. Even though, yes, it's just a guy in a suit. We all know that. Mm-hmm. But look at that suit. <laughs> look at the yeah, detail. Yeah, it's awesome. Look at, look at the miniatures that were – all the detail that was put into those miniatures and those cities that they had to build, which they had to build to a much larger scale mm-hmm. because they were using someone in a suit. And the the reasoning behind the suit – and you know it's pretty, um, pretty synonymous now with Godzilla is the idea of someone in a suit – Although obviously in like the newer movies, you know, it's all CGI and everything. But at the time, you know, that's how these monsters were portrayed. Um, before that, it was stop animation with movies like King Kong and, and uh, Lost World and things like that. Um, and you'd have claymation and stop animation uh, monsters, which are phenomenal. And I, I love that type of animation, those type of effects. And they were originally going to use stop animation for this movie. But when the director, Honda, um, when he was told how long it would take for these, uh, for the stop motion effects, uh, I believe it was something like seven years um, by the time it was all said and done, uh, and taken into account, like all the, you know, I'm sure it was a lot more expensive and things like that. Mm-hmm. He opted to go for someone wearing a, a Godzilla suit. So um, that's when the suit was designed. And uh, the they did, so the design of the creature is very interesting because the name Godzilla, um, so it's a combination of two different words, the Japanese word for gorilla and for whale. Mm-hmm. So Which um, those, those words are gorilla and jujira. And could, Kajira. Yeah. So when you combine those two words, it, you know, Gajira, which, and then was sort of uh, formed into Godzilla, which is apparently it's correct to say either version of this. I'm, I've been told. Um, so the, but yeah, the American version obviously called Godzilla. And the, so the creature in the design, um, originally it was very different. It was actually 
speaking of on the nose, it was it had the head of a mushroom cloud. Um, so they definitely, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad they didn't go for that design. It's interesting, but I'm glad they didn't go that route. Um, so they went more for, uh, you know, the fact that it was a combination of the word gorilla and whale and just mm -hmm. thinking of this large, massive beast and then taking the prehistoric design into uh, into the fold and you end up with a, a dinosaur type creature that walks on two legs has a huge spiky tail, um, has spikes that also there's tinges of radiation on them, which uses, um, you know, actually like traditional animation, cell animation for those, mm -hmm. which is interesting to kind of highlight that radiation. Um, so you have a very impressive looking creature and you, mm -hmm. you, we don't linger on the creature for very long no. in any one shot. So, you, you know, because I know some people, uh, they joke around like you can see the zipper and things like that. But I think, you know, again, I think this was a very sophisticated and yeah. well-made uh, I didn't suit. see any zippers. So no, <laughs> I, I think if you're I think, seeing I the zipper, just, uh, yeah, yeah. You, if, if you're seeing that, you're probably going back and looking for it. Right. Which isn't really um, the way we're supposed to. Not, uh, yeah, there's no way supposed to treat movies, but I don't think that's kind of the point. Yeah. And it's like I said, I, I, in my opinion, I, I find it still very impressive, mm -hmm. still very effective. Like the destruction scenes in this movie are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, there's not, you know, when you think of this movie, you think that the whole movie is Godzilla destroying a city. But it's really not that much of the no. film where he does that. But when he does, you know, it's very effective, mm -hmm. I think. And it's fascinating from a filmmaking standpoint as well, Jeremy, because we often talk about uh, different techniques in filmmaking and things like that because we're coming at it from that perspective. Um, and what they achieved with their limitations with this mm -hmm. film, which is something that I'm always interested in and fascinated by, um, you know, what they achieved with their limitations, with not having certain special effects at their disposal, like like even stop animation, which at the time was pretty, you know, you would see it pretty frequently, but mm -hmm. they didn't even have that to fall back on. So they had to really make do with what they had. So yeah. they had to construct these entire cities to scale um, yeah. along with the creature and you know, the detail um, in these models are incredible. They're very convincing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work, a lot of hand work was put into put, put into these uh, these models. And uh, like I said, even the suit itself really isn't that bad. Um, mm -hmm. And when you, when, especially in context of what's happening. And again, you're only presented with images of the creature very for very uh, short dur durations. So mm -hmm. you're not lingering on it very long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just thinking about, you know, how many hands were involved mm -hmm. in creating all these miniatures, um, and essentially entire cities too. I mean, um, just so they could be toppled over and stepped on. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very um, interesting. An another thing I'd just like to note also, yeah. and uh, once again, sorry for butchering the name, but the absolutely brilliant work, particularly with how they shot the monster scenes, the cinematography by Masayo Tamai, um, really, because I, I find that a lot of the time with these kind of 20th century, you know, monster horror, whatever, where there are practical effects, th they can so, no matter how good the effect is, it can totally be ruined if the scene isn't lit and framed properly. Mm -hmm. And and these kind of low angle frames with this stark black and white photography, you know, with, with like the sh the shadows are just hard, and you're kind of not seeing everything. And like you mm -hmm. said, Mark, the, the, some of that, that two D cell animation, but just yeah. the, like the, like the way that that Godzilla kind of moved in the dark, and you would see these highlights, but because it was an actual human being in a suit, the movements mm -hmm. felt very organic. It, it seemed more, like yeah, all much of more the actor like. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, of course, we're we're watching this movie, you know, over half a century since it came out. So mm -hmm. there are certain things that aren't going to hold up perfectly. But I, I did think that really, like, there were there were moments when I, I was watching it and I thought, like, this, this feels more yeah. real than things I've seen that came yeah, out in the past like, five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, how'd they do that? And mm -hmm. a lot of it was double exposure, you know, they, but it done very well um, mm -hmm. to, the po to the point where it's almost seamless in a lot of the scenes. Totally. And because um, sometimes I would actually look for you know, sometimes yeah. you can tell these older movies like mm -hmm. you can tell where one shot begins and the other one ends but which will really, we this... will be getting to further into this series there are some yeah. not oh, as shiny examples <laughs> so stay yeah. tuned but exactly uh, but we're starting with a very prime example of this mm -hmm. and um, yeah just phenomenal job with the effects and uh, the Godzilla suit was um, you know it was made of very rough materials um, which only granted the performer you know I think it was three minutes, I believe, mm -hmm. in the suit before passing out from heat exhaustion. Yeah. Um, and the performer inside the suit was sweating profusely all the time. 
Um, and actually there's a very short video. I think it's only three minutes mm -hmm. or something on YouTube, uh, that I found called the man who was Godzilla. Um, and I saw it, I actually saw it a while ago. I'm going to post mm -hmm. a link for it. It's yeah. very short. So only if, if you know, you only have a couple minutes, you can just check it out, but it's actually him talking just about his experience very briefly. Mm -hmm. Um, but he's a fascinating guy. The actor inside the suit's name was Haru Nakajima and he really gave it his all. He, approached this as an acting exercise he was actually in some uh, akira kurosawa films as well there is some sort of connection here between these uh, two film uh, the filmmaker uh, the director of this film and akira kurosawa actually um but yeah so he was an, uh, a trained actor and he took this role very seriously whereas a lot of people would have just probably zippered up the suit and uh went out there and slammed some buildings, you know, stomped on some stuff. He looked at it as, you know, he, he wanted to get into the, the mind of the character and what, what the character was thinking. And, you know, and you can see that in his movements when he's moving around. And I think that's something that even though I love stop animation and probably, and I would say prefer it to this type mm -hmm. of effect, I would say it's, it's done so well here. And, you know, if you're going to do it, this is the way to do it. I would yeah. Say. And um, he really set a precedent also, because as we started moving into you know, computer generated imagery. Imagery. We we have actors mm -hmm. like Andy Serkis, most yeah. Uh, yeah, Andy Serkis, most famous for pla the Planet of the Apes movies and and playing mm -hmm. Gollum slash Smeagol in Lord of the Rings. And it's like it's it's that kind of thing. You know, I, I don't know if we get an Andy Serkis without without this guy who mm -hmm. it kind of developed that otherworldly physicality and, yeah. and really turned acting as something not human into an mm -hmm. art form. Right. So re really you know, you're innovative. Playing yeah, definitely. Even though you're playing an imaginary creature, you're still mm -hmm. putting everything you have into it. And mm -hmm. that creature is still a character, you know, mm -hmm. it's still. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is a very early. You're right, Jeremy. I think you can draw a through line there um, between the two very early um, instance of that. So that's great. Um, so, yeah, a lot to dig into there. Special effects, you know, they were very uh, revolutionary, I would say, for the time. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I still, I watch this movie still and I'm like, that's very impressive, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I, I still love it. Um, and the other thing I'm very impressed by is the music, the score for this mm -hmm. film. Um, I think it adds so much and it's almost as, if not just as memorable, in my opinion, as the film itself. Um, because when I think of this movie, I, the first thing I think of is the score, mm -hmm. um, cause it's so iconic. And I mean, part of it is because it is repeated a lot, uh, you know, so there's that, <laughs> but, um, not too much. I mean, I, there's movies that overuse a the theme more than this one does, but, mm -hmm. um, I think it's just really great and certainly effective and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of grandiose and foreboding, which is, you know, the theme that we talked about. Um, and I think, it's just, yeah, it's just very effective. And that composer, Akira Efukabe, or Efukube, hope I'm not butchering that too much. Um, he would please. compose more than, yeah. yeah. If you, <laughs> if you know how in. to pronounce the names, please let us know, because it would please be nice Please let us to... know all of the, yeah. yeah. Um, but he would go on to compose more than 250 film scores. So he, you know, he was very prolific. But he would even say that the high point was um, his work with the Godzilla films and this film in particular, where he he also created the trademark roar of Godzilla, which is very distinctive. And like we said, starts off the film um, and he did it a very interesting way. He produced the sound by rubbing a, a resin covered leather glove along loosened strings of a double bass. Uh, which is really interesting and like it makes you know when you read that you're like interesting but how, how actually, cool is that oh, that's, when you that's actually it. but when yeah. you actually listen to it you can actually hear it it's so yeah. interesting um and the footsteps as well i think he created those uh just by striking an amplifier box so mm -hmm. very like organic ways of, of getting these yeah. noises but it's so effective mm -hmm. because when you hear that roar like you almost think like oh they probably took different animal sounds and put them together but really mm -hmm. not at all no. um so i think that's very interesting yeah. very creative um, yeah and um, the la really one of the last things I want to talk about besides um, the themes, the special effects and the music are the American version of the film, the American, I guess you could call it a reworking mm -hmm. of the film because it is quite different. And it's something that I actually, I forgot until I, you know, I popped in because I had the, the Criterion Blu-ray of this one. And um, I was like, oh, what's this other version on here? Because <laughs> I completely forgot that Godzilla, it's, so it's called Godzilla King of the Monsters is the American version. Came out a couple years later, I believe 1956 was when it officially released. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when it came out here in, in America. And it was extremely different. Um, for starters, the opening that we talked about 
uh, in the beginning of our show, Jeremy, um, about how effective it was and how foreboding and haunting and all of that, all of that gets thrown out the window in the mm-hmm. American version because they go for a completely different effect, which is interesting um, in a certain way. And especially at the time, this, this type of um, narrative style or storytelling technique wasn't seen very much. But the beginning of the film, you have the voice of a narrator and you see, actually start with scenes of the aftermath of the destruction of the city. Interesting. Um, so that's how they they start the film in the American version. And then you have the narration come in, which I'm not a huge fan of narration in movies. I mean, it can be done well. Mm-hmm. There are, yeah. there are in, obviously examples of it being done well. But mm-hmm. to me, it can be seen as like, you know, sometimes like a, a, a technique to get around things. And I think mm-hmm. in this instance, obviously, because what they ended up doing was using footage from the original film. So the the version that we're talking about, the 1954 uh, Japanese version, they would take scenes from it and then uh, film completely new scenes with American actors. Mm -hmm. um, And they would just, you know, splice the two together, put a narration over it of the main character, and they would essentially make their own version of this film, Mm -hmm. Um, which I haven't sat through the entire thing. I only (laughs) kind of skimmed through it. But yeah, to me, just not as effective um, in general. But it's interesting as, uh, you know, just it, from film history standpoint, it's interesting that they that there is another version that came out around the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people, you know, when growing up, they didn't have <laughs> Criterion DVDs and Blu-rays and mm-hmm. all that, you know, so they to them, this is the version that was shown in America, you know, on TV. Like yeah. the King of the Monsters version was the version of Godzilla that people knew. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are there is a bit of dubbing and not as much dubbing as you know, there's, it's almost like the whole movie is dubbed when people talk about it, but mm-hmm. really not too much dubbing, but really f- full scenes that were filmed uh, with American mm-hmm. actors. And so it's it's quite a different movie. Um, and a lot, of, like I said, a lot of the uh, wartime allegories were taken out. Yeah. So a lot of that is definitely lessened. Uh, Although I, w- I will say that there is something very in line with a lot of the other 1950s sci-fi movies that we'll be talking about with doing something yeah. like that. Because mm-hmm. these kind of like, well, you already have something available, so just work with what you have. And right. so clearly they had licensed rights to this this name and property, this, this intellectual property, but mm-hmm. knew they had to an appeal to an American audience. But rather than just remake the movie, they said, well, we already have these things. I, I'm looking at it here. It looks like the budget was $650,000, which was not a small budget. Mm-hmm. back then you know it wasn't like that was nothing but yeah. you know it wasn't you know it was it still wasn't a big budget for a movie back mm-hmm. then by any stretch of the imagination and yeah. so you know kind of kind of th- that that innovative you know using what you have do your best but make a quick buck idea yeah. produced a lot of really interesting stuff and you know i mean yeah. I, I haven't seen godzilla king of the monsters but i it's i would different. imagine <laughs> it kind of falls in line with some of these other 50s sci-fi b movies that we will be talking about in mm-hmm. its construction and yeah. the the kind of hodgepodge um, final product. Yeah, they they wanted to center it around an American star, obviously, and they mm-hmm. they chose Raymond Burr. So he had just come off of uh, Hitchcock's Rear Window. Actually, mm-hmm. he played the suspected murderer in that film. Um, would go on to be Perry Mason. So he was, you know, not like the hugest star, but at the time, I guess, was a, I guess, a logical choice for the studios to put him in the starring role. And the whole film is told kind of from his perspective. He's a, a journalist reporter that goes to J- Japan and gets stuck there when all these events take place. So they use him as sort of like the conduit, you know, for the Americans, I guess, to uh, mm-hmm. to take the story. And I guess they saw that as more palatable or I'm not mm-hmm. sure what the reasoning was there. But mm-hmm. um, so that there you have it. And like I said, that's the version that a lot of people would see on TV. And that's the version of the film that a lot of people grew up with, like a, a people of a certain generation. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's interesting because to me, when I think of Godzilla, you know, when I was a kid, when I was younger, um, I th- would always think of the <laughs> Roland Emmerich version. Um, you know, the directors of uh, Independence Day and those, mm-hmm. those movies at the time, they made a version of Godzilla in 1998 with Matthew Broderick in it. Uh, not the greatest movie. And that's what I would always think of when I would think of Godzilla. You know, I don't know if you've seen that one, Jeremy, but uh, it's it's OK. It was very much yeah. um, uh, reminiscent of trying to recapture what made Jurassic Park so great. I think they tried mm-hmm. to rely on that and a lot of CGI and stuff like that. So um, that's so it's interesting how different generations have 
different versions of Godzilla. And now obviously there's the newer ones, the new series. That's, uh, you know, I haven't seen any of those. I don't know if you've seen any of the I newer Godzilla movies. No. I think one just came out like last year or this year even, mm-hmm. or no, I'm sorry, last year. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, there's these movies, um, they just like keep coming. Said, <laughs> they just keep coming. I mean, it was, and, and like we alluded to this film, Godzilla, when it came out was somewhat of a phenomenon and it, there was an entire slew of similar monster movies and, there actually is a name for the the genre. It's called kaiju, mm-hmm. um, which is Japanese for strange beast, and it's a specific Japanese genre of films. Um, so from there, you know, you get the not only the sequels to this film, but you have Mothra and the different mm-hmm. uh, mo- other monsters that Godzilla would encounter, and sometimes Gal- Godzilla would be the hero of the movie. Like, yeah, you know, we talked about him being a sympathetic character, but he's sometimes he's just an outright hero. Um, and he is fighting the bad monsters and helping people. So, you know, the, it, de- it definitely went some different directions. And, uh, because there has been so many of these movies, you, you almost can't fault it for trying to take different spins on the, on the idea. But mm-hmm. I think this original idea is, you know, yeah. I think it's the most, has the most depth to it. And, mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if they've gone back to this more somber tone in the newer yeah. ones. It, it was the the original this this 1954 version wasn't a monster movie. It was an allegory yes. that used yeah. a monster. Um, just very much. Side note: I just brought it up here. It looks like I'm looking at the most recent Godzilla movie, which is actually called Godzilla: King of the Monsters. King of the Monsters. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and it the grow it at the box office it made against a 170 million dollar budget. It made 385.9 million dollars. So clearly the Godzilla fever is still here. Oh yeah, it's still working. So well, we're gonna keep still, getting you know, it. At the very least, people just want to see monsters breaking shit and yeah. <laughs> destroying cities. I mean, that's just gonna be like an age-old mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, form of entertainment that people want to see. Um, so it makes sense that it would still mm-hmm. be around. I think, but I think the fact that it, it started this way and that it does have that deeper meaning is just very interesting. And there's always been something about this monster in particular it's something about godzilla um that just really resonates and i think it, it is that deeper meaning mm-hmm. that we talked about um but you know the the countless sequels and spin-offs and remakes i mm-hmm. mean they've run the gamut from what we started with here to like the very silly b movies that we're going to get into a little bit more mm-hmm. <laughs> later in the series but uh you know it's, it's a wide range of of things and you could draw a through line from those types of films to like the power rangers and mm-hmm. and those type of like mech um large mech uh it, that actually has its own genre of films and and anime <laughs> and things like that so you know it, you can draw a through line there so it's very interesting to see where it all began and it really did begin here with this movie mm-hmm. um absolutely so yeah i mean that's that's pretty much all I wanted to say about this movie, but was there anything else you wanted to, to um, add in about it? Not not really about this movie, but um, I just recently, just a, I guess a recommendation, if, if you haven't seen it, um, right now as we record this in early 2020, um, the, the film that just won the best picture at the Oscars is Parasite, um, directed by Bong Joon-ho, and he directed a really, really wonderful monster movie um, I believe it was 2006, um, called The Host, right. that definitely having seen the, uh, the original Godzilla, it, it to me at least feels really clear that he was looking at this. So if you enjoyed Godzilla, uh, the 1954 version, um, and you are a Bong Joon-ho fan, then I would highly recommend going and checking out The Host because it is an awesome, awesome, awesome uh monster movie that in the same way as Godzilla is dealing with a lot more than just a monster. So just a recommendation. And that's the thing, like besides all the um, remakes and spinoffs and all of that, there's been a lot of movies that have just been inspired by this movie. And we talked about Mm -hmm. uh, Jurassic Park and and I think even Jaws and lots of different monster and creature movies like that. But even up to like Cloverfield, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously very inspired by Godzilla seen from a a different perspective, like a found footage uh, type uh, of movie. And, um, also the host like you just mentioned and yeah i mean that it keeps going um so i think we're always going to see new takes on this on this type of monster movie mm-hmm. uh for better or worse and uh we're going to look at some other similar uh types of movies about monsters but also very different mm-hmm. much more in the campier vein uh, much more b movie but they are very fun in their own right and i think worthy of talking about so We'll get into that next time with our next film, which actually came out the same year. Um, it's from America, and it is called Them. It's about giant ants. So, 
a little different, but you know, the same general ideas is at play here with uh, the historical context and uh, what was going on in the world at the time. So I think these movies are, you know, just very interesting to look at, especially with lots of perspective and, you know, because they're entertaining in their own way, but also they, you know, it goes deeper than that. And mm-hmm. that's what we're going to talk about. So exactly. thank you for listening to Cult Movie Cult. And uh, we're going to keep the series going next time. But uh, in the meantime, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you have any other cult films you'd like to hear us discuss on the show, or if you'd like to officially join the cult and be a guest on the show, please feel free to reach out to us at cultmoviecult at gmail.com. This has been Cult Movie Cult. And until next time, so long from the other side.